Welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Habit Chonistu. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong strategic national security oriented policies. Our movement consists of more than 20,000 people in Israel, including many reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense Establishment who believe that strong national security and staunch Zionism are necessary for Israel to be the eternal homeland of the Jewish people. Thank you so much to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into these briefings. It is so important for us here in Israel to be able to bring you this content about what is happening really on the ground in these very candid and direct briefings. It's a great privilege today that I am joined by Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi, the founder and president of Alma Research and Education Center. Sarit, thank you so much for joining. Before we jump into the, the details, about what's happening in the north, maybe you could just give us a quick understanding of why you started the, the Alma Research Center. Well, I actually, you know, what shaped my, my who I am today is uh, the previous war between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006. I was back then uh, a major in the research and analysis uh, division in the headquarters in Tel Aviv. I was also nine months pregnant, but this is a different story. And um, uh, part of what I dealt with was what we call the international clock, meaning uh, when exactly will be the timing that uh, the US president or the United Nations Security Council will uh, tell Israel to stop. Something that by the way happened again and again and again, also in later operations in Ghana. And I uh, unfortunately learned that uh, this international pressure is extremely important in light of a war that the other side is using, uh, an asymmetric warfare, is using the civilians as human shields, and they are getting killed and everybody blames Israel and everybody just wanted to stop without understanding that if it just stops, we are not solving the problem. And nobody's ac actually asking the question, who should be held responsible for the killing of civilians back then in Lebanon. So for me as a resident of the Gali, I live in Kfar Vodim, which is around nine kilometers from Lebanon, was extremely important to bring up and to raise their awareness of what is happening here and what are the security challenges that we are facing here on the northern border of Israel. And when I ended my service, I established Alma Center to educate and research exactly on these topics. You know, a lot of our briefings have focused heavily on Gaza, obviously, in the war in Gaza, but there's so much to discuss on the northern border. Right now in the news, let's just jump right into it. Right now in the news, there's discussion of a diplomatic solution uh, to what's happening with Hezbollah. Do you think there's a possibility of uh, Hezbollah, of the pressure on the north, stepping down uh, because of uh, some type of diplomatic uh, solution? I want to connect to what uh, our head chief of staff said, and he said that the Israeli first priority is always to try a diplomatic solution. And if this is not working, uh, we are willing to go uh, to a military solution. By the way, uh, which is a well-known uh, policy uh, decades ago in the history of uh, military and, and security uh, of Clausewitz. But um, what I want to say is that if we want to try a diplomatic solution, it's important not to try a diplomatic solution that already failed, which is UN Security Council 1701 uh, that actually ended the previous war. And again, I, I understood back then that the way this resolution is phrased and the way this resolution is bringing more, the solution was the UN force at, on, the, on the zone, boots on the ground, and not, not nobody else, it's, it means not solving the problem. And actually, it, this, this, this resolution uh, assisted to the creation of a reality which is far more dangerous than what we experienced in 2006. Okay, so if 1701 was not successful, is there any chance that right now Hezbollah will retreat to the north of Latani River? Is that a possibility at all, keeping with the 1701 resolution, or that's dead on the table? I can't see Hezbollah is doing that. It may put face 
as it had done in 2006, as if it is doing that. And that's why the real question is, who is enforcing whatever arrangement that will be made, 1701 or another? Again, I'm, I don't think that 1701 is a good solution. But if we have any diplomatic arrangement, who is going to enforce this? Because you must understand that Hezbollah is deployed in every third home in South Lebanon is used for Hezbollah military purposes, whether it's logistics, whether it's headquarters, whether it's intelligence, and whether it's rocket caches. And who is going to take the rockets out of the homes? When you we look at what is happening in Gaza today, you understand that the process of cleaning a town or a neighborhood that is full of munition and that is fully prepared for war, it's not something that is, it's easy to be done. And Hezbollah is not going to voluntarily doing that. So it may put uh, faces, pretend that if, yeah, we, we will redrawn to the Litani River. And even this, I don't think it's the probable scenario, but uh, I don't see Hezbollah just redrawing uh, even when we talk about deterrence and which which is again it's it's a, it's it's a very problematic word uh, in our neighborhood but uh, if we talk about uh, the achievements of the idf until now if we talk about attacks inside lebanon i don't see these attacks pushing hezbollah uh, further north uh, voluntarily okay uh, it will take much more than that much more pressures than that and international pressures that are coming from the West directly on Lebanon are also not a solution because these international pressures are working with the Christians of Lebanon that are the opponents of Hezbollah anyway, but they don't have the power to enforce this. So these international pressures should work on the Iranians, which are the real boss here, rather than the Lebanese government, which is actually meaningless with regard to the capability to implement any arrangement that will include the withdrawal of Hezbollah from South Lebanon. And then, the, so the presence of the UN, are they, are they doing anything positive? Is it just hurting the situation? Where does the UN fall out with this? Um, yeah, somebody asked me to turn off the computer behind me, so one minute. Okay. Yeah, this is confusing, that's fine. Um, the UN uh, is uh, deployed in South Lebanon, exactly in this area that was uh, created in the end of the war in 2006 from uh, the border to the river, to the Litani River. In most areas, it's around 20 kilometers uh, into Lebanon. In other areas, it, it's much less than that. And uh, this area was supposed to be empty of any illegal military presence, whether it's Hezbollah or any other organizations. Uh, for the sake of implementation of this resolution, 10,000 UN forces were deployed in South Lebanon, but the resolution doesn't say who should implement uh, or enforce. And there is an article in the resolution that says that the mission of the UN is to assist the Lebanese army establish this area, which is free of any illegitimate weapon. And at the same time, it is saying that the UN uh, can do whatever it takes to make sure that this area is not used for any violence. So this is the kind of contradiction uh, inside, uh, in, in the resolution. <clears throat> this is the kind of contradiction uh, in, in, the, in what this resolution is saying. This actually created the reality uh, in South Lebanon that is a reality uh, of an ineffectiveness of the UN. The soldiers of the UN are not entering into private territories. So it means they're not only not entering into houses, they are also not entering into olive orchards, for example. They are not entering into the Shiite towns uh, of Lebanon. They are not entering anywhere where the rockets are. And that's why this mechanism didn't work. Now, I used to say until the past year, I'll be honest with you, that the UN was effective with regard to 
uh, preventing an escalation that nobody wanted, meaning that the UN was there on the borderline itself, and if there were clashes between IDF soldiers and Hezbollah, or IDF soldiers or Lebanese army uh, forces, well, in most cases, the UN succeeded in calming this down. Even with this level of calming things down, the UN failed in the past year. And we have seen more and more clashes and more and more violence in the past year, more and more presence of Hezbollah in the past year on the border, uh, which created a situation that UN was completely ineffective uh, over there. So do you think a ground invasion by the IDF is inevitable? Is that the only thing that will push Hezbollah back? No, I think this is getting into IDF uh, contingency plan, which I'm not interested in. Uh, I don't know whether it's ground invasion, airstrikes, whatever, but I think it is clear to all of us that to clean South Lebanon for a military deployment that is basically very similar to what we see in Gaza, except the terrain is different. Because you have, on the one hand, it's less crowdy, which is also very important to, to bear in mind. There are a lot of small towns that are spread in the area, but on the other hand, it is bigger. And uh, it's not flat. So the winter, it's also something that is meaningful. Uh, it's hills and valleys, it's rocky. There are places to hide. Uh, the fighting there is much more challenging for both sides. It works for both sides uh, when we speak of South Lebanon. It's very, very different when we speak about the ground operation in South Lebanon than in Gaza. You see, for example, the importance of tanks in Gaza, which is flat. In South Lebanon, it's a little bit different, and this will be have to take in consideration when we speak about the ground invasion there. Um, I don't know, but the bottom line is that the solution that has to be found must be effective and limited. Uh, if it's a diplomatic solution, it must be uh, limited in time. It must have a deadline to make sure that eventually I can live in peace here up north. And we had alerts this morning in my town and there were missiles that inter intercepted above my home. Uh, the, the people that were evacuated, 60,000 people will be able to go back to their homes and we can have normal lives in the galley which I don't see uh, how Hezbollah is getting back to this after it created this new reality on the border. So just to clarify, when you talk about a potential diplomatic solution, who are the parties involved? Is it a discussion directly with Iran? Does Hezbollah have an, their own voice in the matter or are they just a proxy and it's entirely Iran and the international community? The Hezbollah has its own voice, but this voice is tied to the Iranian voice. Maybe Iran speaks through Hezbollah. Okay, that's the trick. Uh, I am among those that uh, believe that Hezbollah is fully co coordinated with Iran. Okay, uh, Hezbollah is the most professional and strongest militia of Iran. So uh, there is a dialogue between the two in a sense that Iran is the boss and Hezbollah is the most senior director of this international company named the Islamic Revolution. Iran would not want to uh, eliminate completely its uh, most senior director. It would want to listen to him and to hear its needs. And part of its needs is to make sure that, uh, that it can continue to control Lebanon and even take further more the control over Lebanon in the day after this war, whatever it is. On the other hand, it is clear that Iran was interested in this war, wherever it is, Yemen, West Bank, Gaza, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon. Iran was interested in this. Iran is the architect in this. Iran planned this. And all this discussion about uh, whether they knew that this is October 7 or October 6 or Passover, I don't know what, I don't think this discussion is relevant. That's why if you ask me whether these international efforts should involve Iran, as, uh, of course they should involve Iran, but this, this should be held as a comprehensive point of view, not only with regard to Lebanon. We cannot isolate Lebanon from everything else. That's one thing. And second, again, if we are working uh, with the Christians of Lebanon, we are actually uh, putting ourselves in kind of an illusion that these Christians of Lebanon actually control in what the Iranians or the Hezbollah would actually do in Lebanon. What we see in the past few, in the past week, actually, 
is official and unofficial speakers on behalf of Hezbollah already setting the terms to this future diplomatic solution. Mm -hmm. And what they are actually trying to say is that Hezbollah is actually a legitimate militia in Lebanon. And if Hezbollah is to withdraw north to the Nitani River, so IDF should withdraw south to Haifa. This is, of course, unheard of. But the danger in what they are actually saying is the model of Iraq. What we have seen happening in Iraq is that the proxy militias of Iran announced that they are joining the Iraqi army, which eventually they only officially had joined the Iraqi army, but practically they are still subordinate to Iraq. If this process will happen in Lebanon again, this is a huge problem and the West should see the lies behind all these announcements. So if we could go back to the Christians in Lebanon for a second, what, what is the goal of Hezbollah? What, what is their number one priority? Is it to listen to Iran? Is it to destroy Israel? Or is it to be a powerhouse in Lebanon and, and take over the Christian minority? What, what do they really care about? Hezbollah wants to establish uh, Lebanon as a state that follows the Iranian revolution, the Islamic revolution values the way it happened in Iran. It wants to take over Lebanon, not only unofficially as it is today, but more over there. And everything that can serve the cause is legitimate. Doesn't matter what it is. And for, for Hezbollah, is a war with Israel, does that help them take over Lebanon? If I were Hezbollah and I was to analyze what happened here in the past 17 years, I would look at it this way. In 2006, half of Lebanon was destroyed. The Lebanese prime minister was crying in the media, asking for help. There was 1701. We, Hezbollah had problems with its own base and complaints and it, it uh, put a lot of efforts to rebuild the support of the Shiite base in Lebanon, uh, in Hezbollah. But after these efforts uh, were, were done, what we see is that Hezbollah, 17 and a half years after the previous war, is extremely stronger than it used to be before 2006. The barrages or the amount of rockets in the hands of Hezbollah are about four times more than they used to be in 2006. The commando brigades, Radwan brigades of Hezbollah, which are now deployed in South Lebanon, are much more equipped, are much bigger, are much uh, more challenging than they used to be in 2006. The international mechanism is very weak. Uh, the, the entrenchment and the stronghold of Hezbollah in the Lebanese state is much greater than it used to be in 2006. Before the war in 2006, there was a national dialogue in Lebanon following 1559, another resolution that called to the complete disarmament of Hezbollah. Nobody's talking about that today. Nobody's talking about 1559 inside Lebanon today. It's not even an option. So if I were Hezbollah and I am patient, why wouldn't I go to war or actually drag Israel into war. And then it will take 15 years, 10 years, five years, 20 years, doesn't matter, to rebuild Lebanon the way Hezbollah wanted to rebuild. With Iranian money, with Iranian ideology. This is what it had done in South Lebanon or in the uh, Shiite neighborhoods of Beirut. Why wouldn't it do it also elsewhere? Meanwhile, there is, um, uh, negative immigration from Lebanon, meaning that uh, many Christians are leaving. The economic Lebanon is a failed state. The economic crisis, the political crisis, no president, no elected government, no uh, head chief of staff of the army. In, in a few weeks, no commander to the army. Who controls Lebanon today? Who is the sovereign of Lebanon today? Your argument is convincing. So let me ask you a question. Why did Hezbollah not attack Israel on October 7th? So first, I want to say, before asking why it didn't attack, I want to say that as a resident of the Gali and as the head of the Alma Center, that we actually look at the whole spectrum, which is the tactical level. I was personally at the border every day uh, before this war in October 6th. 
And uh, I saw on the tactical level Hezbollah watching us, building its military positions daily on the border. We saw on the operational level, we were, we were familiar with Hezbollah military uh, uh, programs and plans. And with the strategic level, we were following on what is happening in the, in the strategic arena of the Middle East, and of course, what is happening in Lebanon. And to our analysis, since we, since we combined all these levels, we evaluated that an attack exactly like the one that happened in the South was supposed to happen in the North. And everybody who lives here on the border will tell you the same thing because we have seen the preparations in our own eyes. And I, I don't know if you can feel my pain, but I feel today that it, 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 something happened along the way, which we don't have the information exactly what happened. And at some point there was a decision in this Shiite axis led by Iran to start this war from the South and not from the North. We can put some uh, assumptions of what exactly happened. Maybe Hezbollah didn't want, as I've said, didn't want to initiate it. It wanted to, to drag Israel into this kind of war uh, gradually. And, and then yes, send Raduan brigades during this kind of escalation. That way has have more legitimacy among the Lebanese. By the way, this is what it is doing now. It is building its legitimacy inside Lebanon uh, to drag Israel into Lebanon. It had done that in the past year. When you look at the a terrorist attack that, that came from Lebanon before October 7th, last Passover, there were tens of rockets, again, that were intercepted above my home uh, that came from Lebanon. So Hezbollah truly really tried to drag Israel into war. And Israel didn't play this game and didn't go to war. Maybe the Iranians said, well, it's time. We need to stop the normalization process, which it's clear to Hamas, to Hezbollah, to Iran, that all of them wanted to stop this process. Maybe the reason was the nuclear issue to progress with this nuclear issue and to attract the attention of Israel to somewhere else. I don't know exactly, but at some point, somebody decided to start with Hamas. Maybe Hamas is testing the water to see how Israel responds, to see how Israel not only uh, wiping up Gaza or, I don't know, destroying Hamas capabilities in Gaza, but actually what's the military action, analyzing the IDF activities, and then learning from that how to uh, plan its own tactical uh, plans in the north. Maybe testing the water means for how long Israel gets legitimacy from the international arena after a massacre of 1,200 Israelis. This is also something that I think the Iranians and the Hezbollah are learning a lot from. And all of that, and again, if you analyze the history and you go to the Yom Kippur War, why would they do it at the same time? It's wasting all their cards at the same day. And in, in Yom Kippur, it lasted for a month and we recovered when I'm speaking about the military level. So I actually think that Iran believes in long wars. Iran believe, believes in, in, in something that, yeah, the, the civil war in Syria can last forever. Uh, in Yemen, it can last forever. What do they care? What Hezbollah care about? Uh, having the northern border of Israel now, uh, and Lebanese, by the way, empty from people on both sides uh, of the border. And I think when you combine all of these details together, you can understand why Hezbollah didn't join in, or maybe I should say didn't join in yet, because eventually, as we can agree, Moshe, this is an unacceptable situation. Like, eventually, something will have to happen, and the head chief of staff said that something Hezbollah understand that this is an unacceptable situation for the state of Israel. For sure, for sure. Let me ask you two more questions and I really appreciate all of this information. I think for our viewers, certainly for myself, this is really a deep dive into what's happening up north. The US involvement, if there were to be a war between Israel and Hezbollah, would Israel need to heavily rely or depend on the U.S. in a way that they have not needed in Gaza? Or is Israel able to take on Hezbollah on its own? 
Wow, this truly really depends where this is heading. Uh, I believe that the IDF can take Hezbollah on its own when we speak of the, you know, straight fightings between IDF soldiers to Hezbollah. But actually, the question, of course, it's much broader than that because the question is, uh, if there is Hezbollah, if there is a war between Israel and Hezbollah, whether Iran will send more proxies to be more active on other fronts as well, whether Iran will decide to raise the tension in other areas against US uh, uh, sites and assets in the Middle East as well. Uh, and another question, which I think this is happening already today, when we speak about uh, US assistance with regard to the munitions, that Israel is using. This is definitely, Iron Dome and others, this is definitely important for us uh, when we speak of another front. And this is something that is already happening uh, these days. Uh, we understand that the, the re this alliance between Israel and the US is something that uh, we, we cannot just give up on, okay? Uh, this is something extremely important. And I think that most Israelis understand it. Um, but I, I want to emphasize that the importance of this alliance is not about deterrence. The importance of this alliance is about truly operational capabilities that the US has and brought into the region that can help us protect ourselves from various scenarios. Sorry, again, I really appreciate all of these answers. Final question, final question, because we're almost running out of time. Um, you live up north. What is the feeling amongst the residents, the people who are not in their homes right now? Do people want to war? Do people feel that they just they have no choice? They can't go back home? What, what, what is the feeling up there? Two things. First, we feel neglected. Uh, we understand the priority of the Israeli government to start from the south. We, we totally understand it. We understand that if we can avoid two fronts war and take it one after the other, uh, this is much better for the state of Israel's security. But we feel neglected because we don't feel that we get enough attention, neither international attention nor from the Israeli government to understand that th this region is empty. There is an area in Israel that is empty and nobody knows when they will be able to go back. There is an area in Israel that we hear in, in you know, in Israeli TV that it is said below the scale of war, a uh, different kind of, of definitions to a daily war. This is actually happening here. Like if I'm standing at my hometown for an hour, you can hear the, the IDF fightings all the time and you can hear the shootings all the time. And you can hear the, the sirens from other communities. And now it started also in my community since Friday, all the time, um, 10 times a day, 15 times a day. Sometimes it's less than, than 15 times a day because the IDF attacks the squads that were on their way to launch these rockets. This is daily fightings here that it doesn't get attention in international media. It doesn't get attention, even in the Israeli media, very little attention. Uh, and the, the people here are farmers. So it's it's funny, we, I'm saying empty, but many farmers are coming to their homes, risking their lives, sometimes even getting killed, treating the goats and the, and the cows and the orchards uh, and the chickens. Um, where, when we will be back to life here? Well, when we will be back to everyday life, I live nine kilometers from the border. I was not evacuated. I was not evacuated. What about my little girl? Can she go to school? Today, all the educational activities were canceled after the, the alerts here. Last week, she went to school only for a week after a month, actually two months almost, that she didn't go to school. This is not normal life, what we have here. You cannot continue forever like that. And now that Hezbollah is using these very accurate anti-tanks, you know, uh, not against tanks, anti-tanks, not against tanks, or not only against tanks, against homes, against people, against farmers, uh, against cameras, against antennas, against IDF forces. We cannot compromise on 1701 again. I think in this, there is a consensus that 
the reality should change completely because if, if we will comply with the reality as it was until October 6, it would mean that we are doomed for another massacre. And, and I, I, this is something that it's, it, we go to sleep with that, we hardly sleep with that, and we wake up with that. Like every morning that I wake up, I say, okay, it didn't happen tonight or, or at dawn. This is the feeling here that we must make sure that it will not happen again in the North because the capability of Hezbollah to carry out a massacre similar to what happened in the South exist and the plan was not written in Gaza. It was written either in Beirut or in, or in Iran. And it was published by Hezbollah, exactly the same plan, including taking abducted Israelis, uh, civilians, Israelis as hostages to become human shields. This is a quote from Hezbollah plan, not Hamas. Sorry, thank you for sharing all of this. I'm so sorry that you feel neglected, but we have many, many, many supporters, viewers watching this right now. And so we now all have an assignment um, for all of our keyboard warriors out there, for people who have connections with your congressmen and your senators or involved in the Zionist causes. Um, Gaza is really important, but so is the North. And you now all have an assignment from Sarit to make this issue known. So Sarit Zahavi from the Alma Research and Education Center, thank you so much for joining. Thank you to all of our viewers and all of our supporters. This was a very enlightening and important briefing. We will be back tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern time with Brigadier General Amir Avivi. Sarit, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.